Uh, th thanks for coming along. We're going to make a start. There might be some people coming in, um, but we should, we should probably get a start on. So welcome to the Grantham Seminar Series. This is the third one uh, this academic year. And today we have Duncan Baker-Brown, who's a director of BBM Sustainable Design and a senior lecturer in architecture and design at the University of Brighton. And he's going to talk about how designers can save the world. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. Can everybody hear me properly? Yeah, good. Um, I'll just start by saying we've had a little technical issue, so I normally just sort of walk around like this doing my slides, but I've got a couple of notes on a couple of slides, and I don't normally have notes, but I have just because I want to get the facts right with people that know what they're talking about. I can uh, get away with it with architects, but with you guys. But the notes can't be read very easily, so I'm going to have to sort of have a good look. Um, but yeah, can, I, actually, is another way of putting this lecture, can designers save planet Earth and what on earth am I talking about? So I'm really interested in the not-so-hidden consequences of uh, humans manufacturing stuff on planet Earth, producing stuff, whether it's buildings or whatever, because this is part of our supply chain. Materials are often illegally sourced, and we just ignore this. Um, we ignore the social deprivation that goes with mining copper, for example, and you try designing and building a, any sort of building without using copper. Some people think there's more copper above ground now than there is below. I don't know how we can make a statement like that. But that's a copper mine anywhere. That's an open cast copper mine. That's a photograph of the last 23 North American bison taken in 1913. The last 23 hiding in somewhere, which is in now what is now uh, Yellowstone National Park. After the photograph was taken, another 10 got shot. So we're just not very good at managing stuff. And we've lost these this year. The last uh, white, uh, great white rhino, northern white rhino male died this year. And these guys are no longer apparently in the wild. So we take everything right to the edge. So we've got, got to learn how to manage ourselves and the resources on planet Earth. And this is something we find very difficult. It's interesting, uh, on the way up today, I, I received a, well, I was looking at Twitter, and the editor of the Architects Journal just said, why is the, the world of construction not engaging with this? You know, what's happening in Poland this week? So. Every day, nearly 5 million tons of waste is generated globally, with around 30% uncollected. And of the 70% accounted for, only 19% is recycled, 11% is burnt, and 70% is still sent to landfill sites. Not in this country, but around the world. So, the UK consumes 600 million tons of products a year. The UK generates about 200 million tons of waste a year, with my construction industry, the industry I'm part of, consuming and creating about 60% of that. The UK construction industry, including the operation and maintenance of the built environment, consumes 60% of all products and accounts for 45% CO2 emissions. And that's the design, the construction, the maintenance, inhabitation, demolish, demolishing and rebuilding of buildings. They're this year's stats. The construction industry, industry consumes nearly all the world's cement, 25% of, of mined aluminium, half of the steel, and 25% of all plastic produced. For every six houses the UK builds, we send one house worth of waste to landfill or incineration at the moment. So we're meant to have hard-nosed developers, but we've actually hoodwinked them into buying 12 to 15 percent of the material they use for a house or an office building to throw away. And we only have one planet. And that's a reference to the concept of one planet living. And you guys are probably, is everybody in the room aware of the concept of one planet living? Yeah? Well, no? Good. But we're still talking about fracking in this country. And I call it burning our way out of recession. We still think at the top of our governments that that's what we've actually really got to do. And it's incredible that here we are at the end of 2018, 
when nearly 30% of our electricity is generated with new renewables that we're still trying to frack. And it's similar to when my grandparents, all four grandparents were from Walthamstow in the east end of London, after the Second World War, they were encouraged to burn coal through the night in their houses. And that was just to kickstart the coal industry. And it's the same now. So perhaps we panic. But it's all right. The Donald's in charge. We're fine. When was the last time that the world's fifth biggest economy and New York State got together to say no to Donald Trump? I'm talking about California, of course. So I think he's an accidental environmental activist because he just makes the other argument for fossil fuels look so dumb that even if there is half an argument somewhere that there isn't, he'll make it look stupid. But perhaps a lot of us feel like this and want to do this. And this is where I have to grab for my slide. So, hope. This is the currency we're dealing with here today in this room. With hope, we can take a breath and pause and remind ourselves to paraphrase, paraphrase Professor Michael Braungart, who I'll talk about in a minute, that humankind is part of planet Earth's natural ecosystem. We are not alien to it. We have a hugely disproportionate ne negative effect upon our planet at the moment, but we do have the collective knowledge and know-how to make the decision to work in harmony with our host planet. And boy, does this feel like a long time ago. I need my glasses for this one. So California just overtook the UK as the world's fifth biggest economy. Governor Jerry Brown has just ordered civil servants to put in place legislation to make California carbon neutral by 2045. After that, to be a net carbon sink. Car Amsterdam has pledged to be waste-free by 2035. In August, 19 cities, including Paris and Tokyo, vowed to make all buildings carbon neutral by 2030, 10 years' time, and to retrofit all others by 2050. This year, 620 cities and 122 regions have reported climate actions to the CDP, a watchdog. Quoting The Economist from September this year, more than 800 firms worth almost $17 trillion have joined the We Mean Business Coalition to reduce their carbon footprint. It gets happier. So we really are dealing with this. I believe it will be competing city-states and regions that give us all hope. Not governments preoccupied with 22 other big issues or distractions like Brexit before they can think of the environment. With over 50% of the world's population now residing in cities, welcome. <laughs> I've lost my place now. That's it, teach me to be. That's all right. This is the good stuff. Hang on. Oh, yeah. With over 50% of the world's population now residing in cities, they are now the main driver for economic growth and have the potential to power a successful circular economy. In 2017, the London Waste and Recycling Board, that no one's ever heard of, published their circular economy route map for London, which outlined a vision for a capital city thriving through the adoption of principles of the circular economy, an economy that keeps products, components, and materials at their highest value at all times. The report identified that by 2036, a circular economy could provide London with net benefits of up to £7 billion pounds, uh, annually, with up to 12,000 new jobs in the area of reuse, remanufacturing, and materials innovation. The EU circular economy package produced and published in December 2015 had similar figures. I think that's about it. I can get on to what I know, which is doing this sort of thing. So it's all about managing resources. And I don't think we need to be mining for new resources. I think we've done that for the last 500 years. I think we've mined everything we need. It's above ground. We need to reuse it. And I think it's designers and constructors who are the procurers of materials, raw materials and otherwise. We specify what we want our things made of. And we need to think about where these materials come from and what happens to our products, whether it's a phone, a car, or a city, at the end of its life. Has anybody read this book? Put your hands up so I can see if anybody has. So you... Okay. 
So that's Professor Braungart, Cradle to Cradle. And his, I've met with him quite often. I've done events with him. And he, has anybody else met him, by the way? He's quite an interesting person. He's quite a character. He's a bit of a sort of, uh, you know, he's the sort of court gesture, jester, but he's quite provocative and gets people thinking. But he basically says the problem with sustainable design is that it's a stick to beat us with. And all we're talking about is behaving badly less often. So we're always talking about reducing emissions. How about no emissions in the first place? So it's do good, not less bad. We're, we've got to be in a world where waste equals food for either a biosphere or a technosphere. And importantly, it's not about feeling guilty about our very presence on planet Earth. As I said earlier, we're part of it. But he will say that recycling, reuse, and reducing the amount of raw materials we use is only delaying the inevitable. So he hasn't got much truck with recycling schemes, reuse schemes. It's just all going to end up in our oceans anyway. And to a certain extent, he is correct. Cut to Sophie Thomas at the RSA. They had this great recovery initiative for about four or five years. It stopped now. Um, and that was looking at mechanisms to facilitate a circular economy. And this was a rather interesting fact and something I believe in, that 80% of decisions made at the feasibility stage of a project currently prevent a closed loop system later on. So designing something, whether it's a building that will be a material store for the future, or a BMW where it can be reused in the future to create more BMWs, not just aggregates and stuff for roads, um, you need to be putting this in at the beginning of a project as an idea, as a concept. You can't bolt on sustainable design or a circular economy principle after designing your normal thing, whether it's a phone or a watch or a car or a city. This is where I'm plugging something. This is my book. I, design, I wrote a book called The Reuse Atlas, A Designer's Guide Towards a Circular Economy. Because I actually still see the value in recycling, even though it's the sort of most straightforward, rather dumb thing you can do. And then you've got a bit, another step forward, which is reuse. A better step, which is reduce, which is try not to use materials in the situation where previously you did. And then the fourth step is closed loop systems. And that's how the book's written, Steps Towards Closed Loop Systems. And it's a case study led book. This sort of book ended with essays by various people, including myself. But in, for, for me, what was interesting is how many people I was able to interview. I interviewed 60 different designers and makers, architects, etc., manufacturers. And I was interested in finding case studies where people had built new buildings using old materials, for example, or people in the textile and fashion industry. These innovators have got inspiring case studies where they're actually making money. So that's the point of the book. It's not an academic book. It's a book with inspi inspiring case studies. And I'll just take you through a couple of these. So the most basic step, as I've said before, is recycling. And it's obvious why it's uh, basic. You're getting a material, and then you're shredding it, melting it, whatever it. And often, you're it's not as valuable or as useful when you do that the second time around. But I was looking in 2012 at people who were trying to use ocean plastic. In the, at first, it was in um, G-Star Jeans. They had this thing called Bionic Yarn. And I couldn't understand why it was so clever. I still can't understand why it's so clever, apart from the source material for the plastic is ocean plastic. So it raised awareness of the issue of, ocean, uh, issue of ocean plastic. And this was obviously a few years ago before it, people were talking about it very much. And I kept coming across this company called Parley. And I wonder what on earth Parley was. What had they got to do with all these things? And basically, it's a, a company that to raise awareness of these issues. And this is Cyril Gutsch, who owns the company. And he's a sort of brand nurturer. Works, he's worked for all the nasties, Adidas, Coca-Cola, all of those people. And in 2012, he lives in Manhattan, by the way. He's German. His, green, his parents are Green Party members. He was not. He basically thought planet Earth was doomed. So he was just in the world of brand nurturing for some reason. In 2012, we got a phone call from Frankfurt. 
friend of his said, you speak German, can you speak to this guy? And it was the captain of the Sea Shepherd. And um, he was in prison, in a police jail. And this is a guy, Paul Shepherd, who's been captaining this boat for 40 years, chasing whalers around the world. And he actually had a TV program in the States, and Cyril remembers him from the TV program. And um, he sprung him from jail, as it were. And he met uh, Paul Shepherd, and Cyril said, why do you do this? Why do you bother? And he said, it's not worth fighting for a cause unless it appears to be impossible. And Cyril sort of turned on his head that day and formed Parley. And they've worked together since then. So this is, a, this is the Sea Shepherd, normally chases whalers. A couple of years ago, it chased a fishing boat for 111 days. On the 112th day, the, shipping, the big factory shipping boat, the captain of the ship, scuttled the ship. It had $5 million worth of, shi of fish on, on board. But because Parley had been tweeting and Instagramming the hell out of it back in Manhattan, nobody would touch that cargo because it was illegally fished. Normally, there's a market for that sort of thing. There wasn't for this boat. So the captain scuttled the ship, and Paul Shepard and his crew, they rescued 75 kilometers of illegal gill nets, and Adidas turned them into training shoes. So these training shoes were launched around about the time of COP21, the, the, where the Paris Climate Change Agreement was signed. The, the soles are 3D printed um, uh, with waste plastic, and the top bit is made out of the fishing nets. Now the idea with this is, if you're wearing those training shoes, those materials have some sort of meaning. They've got a narrative. If you know where they've come from, will you throw those training shoes away? Adidas have a take-back scheme for these things. But the interesting thing is a designer, if the material source comes with a story, does it change the thing, the artifact? And you can get these things now. And in fact, you can get a football kit made out of ocean plastic. The interesting stroke worrying thing about this is Adidas don't make much of, much of a deal about it. You would have thought it would be a big, big deal. I got a pair of the training shoes in an Adi uh, sent to me from Adidas. There's no information about what they are at all, and I'm wondering what that was all about. But boring companies like the company that probably supplied this carpet in this floor. This, is car this carpet's made out of plastic. If it was from Interface, it might have been made out of fishing nets salvaged by fishing communities in the Philippines and the Ivory Coast. Interface are the biggest carpet suppliers in the world, or manufacturers, and they're saying by 2020, all their source material will be either, either waste carpet or these fishing nets. So that's a huge company doing that. So what they're doing is saying, we don't need petroleum-based raw material. We'll use waste material. And we were collected at the end, so we won't get taxed for throwing stuff away. We'll turn this nasty material into a little nasty closed loop and perhaps start cleaning up the planet at the same time. And you can do it with all sorts of things. Obviously, there's a lot of that around. We've got students from the University of Brighton who now make a business out of making things out of waste coffee, coffee cups and coffee grounds, making new coffee cups. This is all around London, and you might have seen it in the airports. So this is a chewing gum bin made from chewing gum. When the chewing gum bins full up, the bin and the chewing gum go to, back to the factory and the whole thing gets reprocessed into new chewing gum bins. A nice little toxic closed loop. So that's recycling. And basically I'm saying recycling is useful if it starts to clean up the environment and raise people's awareness of material sources. But the problem with it is it could make the plastic industry think, it's all right, it's been sorted out. We'll carry on doing what we're doing. So it's not all good. What's more clever is reusing. So instead of turning that, this is plastic, I think, in turn of turning that into recycled plastic, we'll just clean it and reuse it again. And we got various people at different scales doing this. So Elvis and Cressy describe themselves as commodity brokers. And Cressy on the left there, she had a meeting with the London Fire Brigade about six years ago and started talking about damaged fire hoses, which is a really tough cross-laminated material. Lots of layers, one hole in it, it gets thrown away. But where is away? They don't like to incinerate it, so they landfill it. She now buys up the world's supply of damaged fire hoses 
and turns them into stuff. Luxury stuff, because they take a bit of pummeling and cleaning, but she now buys out the world's supply of fire hoses. And she has 14 or 15 other waste streams that she's partners with a company, and they do all sorts of different stuff. She's working with IKEA at the moment with waste leather to turn into products for IKEA. So it's identifying piles of rubbish and then clients that might want that stuff. Quite an ancient um, business model. This is something I did. And it's the Brighton Waste House. And it's not a house, um, but it is Europe's first permanent building made of 90% material other people threw away. It was bought, built by students, one sort of grown-up builder that ran the site, plus some apprentices, plus students learning design and architecture and students learning construction. Initially, it was a project where we said, remember that, by when we started this, every five houses built, one house worth of rubbish gets sent to landfill. Our challenge initially was to build a low energy eco house or carbon, carbon neutral building using that waste material just from building sites. It evolved. So for example, the walls there that you can see are not tiles. Well, they are tiles, but they're carpet tiles, 2,000 carpet tiles. And it was delivered on budget and on time. It creates 30% more energy than it consumes, and some of the builders were as young as 15. And we had this phrase, there's no such thing as waste, just stuff in the wrong place. 360 students, apprentices, and volunteers helped to construct the waste house. We had 750 school children visit the site while it was on site for a year. And you can see they've got all sorts of strange plastic stuff in their hands. So we work with an organization called Freegal, which is a national organization for swapping stuff. And that national network got us some um, people with ideas saying, why don't you use this? Why don't you use this? So we pretty quickly drifted, or a bit more than that, we changed direction and went from a, a house that, or a building that was made out of construction waste to a project that was a, th a thought provoker, a polemic, saying, do you realize? So for example, that's what 25,000 toothbrushes looked like. That. We collect the, collected them in only four days because we got contacted by Gatwick Airport because we were looking for toothbrushes because we thought we were in Brighton and Hove. We've got a population of a quarter of a million people. We've probably got a million old toothbrushes. So let's see how many we get. We got about 700. Most of those from the school kids that came. And even one school party, they arrived half an hour late for this visit to the waste house and said, sorry, we went to Boots first to buy the toothbrushes. And then we got a phone call from these guys that said, we can get you toothbrushes. Four days cleaning out at jet airliners as they landed in Gatwick Airport. If you fly for more than two hours, you tend to get given a toothbrush that you never use. So this is fossil fuels reprocessed into plastic just to go straight into the bins. But we also found this sort of thing. We use 4,000 VHS videos. DVD shops closed down the year before we were on site, so there's billions of DVDs. We could have filled up the volume of the waste house with, with video cassettes. Denim, this is a 21st century business plan that's very successful. Import ready-made jeans from China, cut the legs off, sell shorts. We had two tons of denim legs. That's a really good insulator. Also this, my bag, it's getting a bit old. It's a present on the launch of the uh, Waste House opening. It's made out of one of these. Vinyl banners, I think someone was putting a banner up somewhere. They now get recycled, but they didn't used to get recycled. Um, and we had a 1,000 of these. And Kat Fletcher from Freegal said, I've got a 1,000 of these banners. What can we do with them? So we put them to one side. And within three months, I'd thought of what we could do with them. And a timber-framed, low-energy house has to have something called a vapor control layer. And that's what this is. So it's old banners stapled with a 300 mil lap that gives the right permeability for those walls. And uh, so we've grabbed hold of 450 banners. Um, since then, those banners are now, they now are recycled. They weren't at all. This is the first floor of the waste house. This is old cycle inner tubes being used for soundproofing between uh, walls, from, from, sorry, between floors from first floor to the ground floor. So if you go like that, you don't hear it below because of the impact sounds. 
uh, reduced with that. We also sealed all the windows and doors with the same thing. We did buy 10% of the waste houses brand new stuff. So we've got brand new solar panels. We could now probably get secondhand ones of these. So this, it's an all electric building, creates 30% more power than it uses. We only use two recycled products on site. This black, you can't really see it, but it's a black single ply rubber membrane that forms the rest of the roof. That's recycled Pirelli car tires. And our staircase is paper, recycled paper, compacted. And it's a material that's normally used in uh, airports, and they normally put tiles on top of it. We left it naked, and it's fine. Katz, Fletcher kept saying, what carpet tiles? We need to work with carpet tiles. And so here we are. Remember, this building made out of waste has got full, full building regs and planning approval. Here's the building regulations inspector from Brighton and Hove. This is David, who ran the site with a blowtorch doing a fire test on carpet tiles. So they're tight. If they were these carpet tiles, we turn them uh, backside outwards, so they're black on the other side. And they were secondhand, and they had a really good fire rating. They don't burn. And they look like that. So we ended up with this other sort of, this sort of materiality, this quality from these new material sources that actually are quite delightful. While we were waiting for the waste house to bit the frame to be made of the waste house because that's made out of waste timber and ply and it's been made by our local city tech the students there um, we did something at um, there's some, there's a, a large construction fair in london every year called eco build and they commissioned us to make this waste totem so this is waste material painted with secondhand paint with tweets on it and so we call that the waste totem and then there's got a central core of timber it's weight stabilized at the bottom with paving slabs, and that is now all in the waste house. We also had this symposium called the Waste Zone, where we had designers and people in the, uh, in the waste as a valuable resource industry speaking, some students there. We're doing the Waste Zone again in March, and it's at Excel, and I've got some pa um, leaflets if any of you are interested. That was 150 square meters of seminar space. In March, we got 1,000 square meters of exhibition seminar space, and circular economy market, so it's quite a growing thing. But the waste totem became the lining of the upstairs studio at the waste house. So this material's been used at least three times. And that was us trying to sort of say this is what the waste house is. That's all the materials and the quantities. And we reckon we've got about 45 tons of uh, waste material that we diverted from landfill and incineration. And what is the Waste House? It's, an ongoing, it's a teaching space, an ongoing research project. So this is my colleague, Nick, who is in charge of the MA in Sustainable Design. And we've got the, these projects, which are student projects. These are material experiments, um, waste material experiments that we do with our 3D craft and design students. And we've also got a couple of um, interreg funded research projects at the moment. And uh, this is an interesting one. Again, it's. Uh, we got it because of the Waste House. So our French project managers and partners came to us and said, could we be involved in this research project where we're identifying waste flows local to the Waste House in Brighton and Hove? And we went to Veolia, who are a large company, a worldwide company that procure waste at the moment. And we said, what textile material is a pain in the neck for you that you can't reuse or recycle at all? And they just said bedding. No one touches. Reads. Nobody wants a second hand, do they? So for a week, they put aside in Worthing at their, their Rio site duvets, and we collected about 120 duvets. 75% of them were uh, polyester duvets, and 25% of them were goose and duck feather duvets. Some of them were from Marks and Spencers and about three months old, looking like they're brand new. Duvets are a huge issue in Brighton. We've got two universities, lots of students. The last thing you do at the end of your degree or master's is take your duvet back to whatever country you've come from. You don't, it's, it's bulky, even if you're within the UK. We get a lot of duvets. We've got hotels, we get a lot of duvets. This area would be exactly the same. None of them are reused or recycled at the moment. What we found, sorry, I didn't tell you, the research project was finding waste materials that could be turned into building components. So what we found here was insulation with a TOG value on it. So it's already given you the thermal value 
the insulation level. So we've, we've been making insulation bats, as they call them, out of um, duvets. We found other waste materials uh, from construction sites to make tiles, and these were early samples. Different waste flows from construction sites local to the waste house. Um, and uh, then we got something really interesting. This is English's restaurant in Brighton. It's an oyster restaurant, seafood restaurant. It throws away 50,000 oyster tiles a year, and some of them. Over 7 million tons of mollusks are thrown away around the world every year. At the same time, we're chopping down forests to get to limestone for the cement industry. It's the same material, just about calcium carbonate, 90% of that. So if you burn some of these, you create quick lime, which is used in cement. And so what we've done is to make tiles for the waste house out of oyster, uh, oyster shells. So it's recycling, there's a carbon footprint, but it's diverting a waste stream. And this is just two weeks ago. So the duvets, this is the outside of the waste house. We removed some of the tiles, put in some duvets. We've got some, we're measuring their ability to be insulation. Then we're making them watertight with these beautiful tiles. They could have been any shape whatsoever. We did them like this so they fitted with what we had with the waste house. And we're monitoring them. We've got one scientist in the Department of Architecture and he likes his gaffer tape. There you go, masking tape. So in the waste house, if you go there, there are lots of these little windows that show you the water in the hollow walls with these interesting materials. Even this material that just looks like normal plaster is oyster shells and brick dust. Until 1861, most bricks in London were made from waste material. We've got a sort of doctor of waste at the waste of, uh, uh, University of Brighton, Dr. Ryan Woodard, and he says in about 1861, we started make, creating waste started to need landfill sites. Um, his point there is that we were so drunk and rich on uh, owning most of the world that um, we were just sort of showing off in a way. We could use more raw materials and throw stuff away. So we've only been naughty for not that long. And uh, actually, if you look at landfill sites, if they go back before 1960, there's nothing in them much. So it's only sort of later half of the 21st cent 20th century where the landfill sites get full of valuable stuff. So step three in the book was reduce. And this is where we're looking at using what's here. And this is deliberately slightly old photo of London. And when this was, this is from the late 1990s, and I went to a conference, it was all focused on low energy stuff. And I actually had someone use this slide saying, most of this has got to, it's actually early noughties, isn't it? Uh, it said, most of this has got to be demolished because none of it performs as a passive house, so none of it is uh, low energy. So we need to knock it down. So all of that was going to landfill, I guess, and then we're going to mine somewhere else to create the materials. This is what we've got to work. But these are our. This is our future. Uh, these are our future eco cities, the ones we've got already, and they're material stores for the future. So this is an example of an architect that went to the mayor of Paris and said, "I know this building." residential tower block, I know you're going to demolish it and build a new one. And because they, for reasons of, um, they had to be uh, public with their accounts, um, they knew that, that what that, the, the city had accounted for to build this new tower. This is the new tower, but these architects went to the mayor and said, we can do it for two-thirds of your cost, the cost you've accounted for. And the reason being is because we won't demolish it. So this is a diagram showing what they did do. That's a flat at the moment. That's the concrete and glass facade of the fat flat. They literally just took it off and put on this winter garden. So that's double glazing, two meters of space, double glazing balcony. So they wrapped the tower block with this sort of um, layer, and that is it going up. The tenants of the tower block didn't leave. They stayed there. So the wall got taken off. The thing got put on. And it's sheltered housing for older people. And now it looks like luxury flats, before and after. So the problem with this is not a lot of light. So you've got your light bulbs on all the time. You don't earn any money. You're on a meager pension. And your energy, energy bills are huge, because you have to have the lights on 24-7. The windows are small as well, so you've got poor ventilation. So you've got fans going 
and you're overheating, it's generally uncomfortable. Here, you've got double glazing space, double glazing balcony. You can control your ventilation. You can control the amount of light. Their energy bills have dropped by 45%. They've got more accommodation. I mean, where would that ever happen? And this is built at two-thirds of the cost. This is interesting. It's about to go on site in Oslo. It's an existing tower block. This is the visual of the final thing. And what's really interesting is this. So the architects here, they've all gone on a cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification course, learning how to what the circular economy might be. And what they're saying is 80% of the material stripped off the old tower will be used for the new tower. So for example, oh, I haven't got it. For example, the old glazing from the 70s is aluminium framed. They found, it's all about the supply chain. They found the original suppliers of the glazing, and they're sending the old glazing system back to the original suppliers who are melting down the aluminium and creating new contemporary glazing systems out of that. And when you recycle aluminium, it only has 5% of the carbon footprint of new aluminium. So, you know, this is massive. And they're not really extending it higher, they're just making it a bit different. The glass that was the external cladding is now being used for internal partitioning. And the rest of the materials they're using are cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified, which should mean that there's a closed-loop system there. But cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification is quite, um, yeah, yeah, not a lot of people are buying into it. They're questioning it at the moment. This is a practice that I've just secured another Interreg project with. They're called Rota. They're based in Brussels. This is them in 2010, where they did uh, th th there's an architecture biennale in Venice every two years. And uh, in 2010, they, they did the Belgian Pavilion. And they had this exhibition called Where. And you walked into it, and you thought, wow, it's a minimalist uh, art exhibition. And then you realize that's a bit of manky old plastic carpet. That was the fireplace. This is where two people sat in front of the fireplace. These are just bits of building. So they're interesting in taking materials out of their context and what then this idea of material meanings. They now deconstruct the most difficult buildings from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So these slides read empty bank building, carefully deconstruct, and then they sell the materials. In some cases, well, th these slides show how difficult the work is. It's not easy work but they make money doing this. They have warehouses, they deconstruct buildings. In some cases, they're hired as architects or interior architects for companies such as Levi's. So one of the big problems in the world of construction is the big commercial companies who want to change their interior design every three to seven years. They just tear it out, start again, tear it out, start again. So Levi's approached these guys, wanted to do that. What these guys did is gave them new, the new interior for their headquarters in Brussels but it was made out of the material from the old interior that got ripped out. So because they're designers, and this is why I think designers have a lot of power here and potential, they made the new interior out of the old uh, in interior. They got paid three times as designers, as deconstructors, and as installers. And this is on there. They've got a, a sister company called Rota DC standing for deconstructing, deconstruction and consulting. And these are the sorts of buildings that they can deconstruct. Less than 20 years old, due for demolition, because nobody really liked them in the first place. They didn't get the best architects in the world. And this is the financial district of Brussels, and it's coming down. Nobody likes it. They can't let it. So they're deconstructing it, and those materials will not be thrown away. They've got a website. You can buy the stuff if you want. This was quite near here, King's Cross. Not really near here, but you know what I mean in London. So this was a project, a pop-up restaurant uh, called The Filling Station. And what was interesting here is a, a, the practice, the architects that designed it called Kamori Grok. Um, they had another project in Liverpool, a Maggie's Centre, a, 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 a cancer respite centre. And this building was only popped up for two years. And these are quite expensive concrete, co these sort of coffered panels. This is the, the Maggie's Centre same concrete panels. So as it was coming down in King's Cross, this was an example of a design consultancy thinking, well, that building's coming down, that old building of ours. Why don't we use that as a material source for our new commission, this one? So I thought that was quite interesting. 
This is some of the techniques that people are using. There's an interesting practice in Rotterdam called super use. They're architects, but they make things out of thrown away stuff. So what they do is they locate that thrown away stuff. This is Amsterdam. And they do these sort of two, four, five, ten kilometer uh, radii out from the site where the project is. And they literally scavenge and look for stuff lying around. They start with Google Earth. And they do this harvest map thing. And they find stuff. Sometimes they find stuff and store it until they have a project. Or they find stuff and they think that could be a project. Or they find stuff and it happens to be for a project that they're doing already. And it's, a, it's something that my own practice does as well. We call it resource mapping. So we're based in Brighton. We've got the South Downs. We're right in the middle of the South Downs. So we've got the coast, the South Downs. We've got landfill sites. We've got functioning brick yards. And so we can find coppice timber, or we can find uh, bricks, or whatever. We can find loads of stuff. We can build with stuff that's already lying around. Did anybody see this program? They dug up a landfill site that was on television. We're working with Zoe with the waste zone in, in, um, in March. So the interesting thing there was they dug up a landfill site from the 1980s and even the newspapers you could read because it had been capped. There was, no decomposing, <laughs> there was no decomposing of materials. And it's this idea I have that we should mine the Anthropocene. And this is what architects and designers can do. We, we all need to do this. So we need to be working with the stop, top stuff the already mined stuff. You will probably know what the Anthropocene is, the current, well, the disputed current geological epoch that we're in now. So that's what we've got to work in. And then we nurture this stuff. It's quite easy, really. Now, step four is proper circular economy stuff, where li where little or no waste is ever produced, where waste is a resource. And you've got these, these concepts that are out there now that are going to be all over the place soon. So this idea is buildings as material banks. If you're constructing a new thing, whether it's a phone or a building, you've got to think of it as a material source for the future. So you have to design it so it can be deconstructed. This is a building from the year 2000. It was, uh, that's, it's a huge building, actually. It doesn't exist anymore because it was just a pavilion. But it was Peter Zumter's Swiss sound box. And it was at the Hanover uh, Expo, at the end of its six months' life. These are springs you can see here, if we go up to the top. They were disconnected, and then you realize you've just got a pile of timber that was compressed by those springs. So that was sold off and given away to hundreds of different building projects. So it was a, timber, it was a material source for the future. So in the future, buildings will be material banks. They will be designed for remanufacture. Materials will have passports, and these passports will tell you what the material is. So you'll be able to scan this, 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 and it will tell you not only what the material is, but what you can do with it, whether it needs to be recycled or reused, how to dismantle this room so you can reuse all this stuff. The different, you know, is this plaster, this ceiling, or is it fiberglass, or what is it? And that works really well because we have something called BIM in the construction industry, building information modeling. So schemes are being made in these 3D models with all the information. So you can do that. You can survey existing buildings and do a BIM model. And that's your material passports as well. But we've also got interesting emerging ways of having stuff. So in here, for example, instead of owning these light bulbs, Imperial College could have um, a contract with Philips or another lighting supplier who would just, the contract would be guaranteeing the right level of lux on the worktops there. And it's up to Philips to maintain that lux level. In other words, maintain those light bulbs. They own the light fittings. They have the light fittings at the end of their life. With that sort of corporate responsibility, they're going to design these lights to last a long time and or they design them so they can be deconstructed really easily and be a material store for the future. Because at the moment, it's we throw away these things. The, the manufacturers don't. And that's changing. So in a circular economy, we have two spheres. We have the organic biosphere and the tech sphere. And this is the one that's difficult. So some of it is quite straightforward stuff, though. I mean, apparently, we have the technology to deconstruct and recycle and reuse 
95% of any smartphone out there. The companies just choose not to. So this is a typical architectural project, a scheme which is a bit of new build and a bit of rebuild, a bit of deconstruction. Thomas Frau are interesting, not particularly as architects, but because they set up other, other companies. That are, that they set up the company that, have, uh, that um, invented the uh, least lux idea that Philips have. But this is one of their architectural projects. So they demolished some of the buildings, but they deconstructed them and they, used, they smashed it up and then nothing left site. It became a material source, a bit like our oyster char tiles for the new buildings as well as the, and the old buildings got refurbished. So this is all material that had been used, had been on the existing buildings, it's now being reused. All steel work was bolted together instead of welded together so it can be unbolted one day. And they used some really, well, what you think is the low grade timber to clad the interiors of the new buildings or the existing buildings that were having additional layer put on them. This is the new building. And what was interesting here is that they didn't get a normal steel fabricator to design and that, or an engineer. They got, um, oh, what's it called? A helter, no, not helter skelter, what's it called? I've got a minute. Sorry, roller coaster. They got a roller coaster designer to design the steel frame because they're used to designing structures that have to be deconstructed. So it's knowing the people you need on a design team. These guys are really interesting. They're from Denmark. They get old buildings, they get an angle grinder to them, they create panels. This is brickwork, so this is reuse. They get panels of brickwork from old buildings and make new buildings out of them. People grow buildings again. So this is a scheme I did 10 years ago for Channel 4. I did a, a live version of the Grand Designs project. So we did, it was called The House That Kevin Built. And this was the UK's first A-plus energy rated building but it was also an exercise to prove that you could have zero waste on site in construction, but also that these fluffy materials, hemp and lime, timber, straw, could create a, a, a sort of high-tech um, building that was prefabricated. The upstairs walls were made out of these. These were all cut, these boxes were cut with a CNC flatbed router within a millimeter tolerance. That's why there was no throwing away stuff on site because everything fitted. Even this cladding, which you can see is different sizes. We mitered the corner, and it was all done with a flatbed router in Hoxton Square. This was outside Excel next to London City Airport. Everything arrived and just fitted. Normally, there'd be a pile of waste associated with that cladding where the carpenters had tried it again and again. And we can do it on a larger scale. Large scale timber buildings are the future. This is a proper university building, UEA. The first thing Archetype, the architects on this building, did when they got the gig was to speak to local farmers and order crops of wheat, barley, and willow. And that's what, pretty much what that building's made of. And it's a proper research building. It's got laboratories, but it's got fluffy stuff as well. What's interesting about that image is that organic, 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 compostable, organic, it's all compostable and organic. That building's been grown. So is this building. This is a building from, uh, it was a temporary building. Six, it was up for six months. But this is really emerging technology, which is really interesting. You guys probably know about. And it's mycelium, mushrooms. <coughs> so the people behind this are based in New York. Uh, no, not New York. They're based in Connecticut, I think. They're called Evocative. And um, these are bricks made out of mycelium and corn stalks. The live at the, um, David Benjamin from the practice called The Living came over and spoke at the Waste Zone this year. It was really interesting. This is the bricks being uh, grown over three days, compressed. You can see the corn in them. This is something that was on at the Liverpool Biennale this September. It's called Hack the Root. That's also mycelium. These are also mycelium, but a lot more silica in them. And these are like normal bricks, but they're grown. I've mentioned Michael Braungart and Cradle to Cradle. He has this whole Cradle to Cradle certification thing. And um, this is Venlo in Holland. It was a city where the population was getting older and smaller. 
It had no, ra no raison d'etre. It is the, the world's first cradle-to-cradle -cradle branded city. Got its identity from cradle to cradle, the cradle to cradle philosophy, and then found it was able to raise 45 million euros for a city hall. I don't know if it needed it. But um, he said the city hall in Venlo, more than merely sustainable. And then, it, and I'm being, I've got an arched eyebrow, by the way. Uh, then all the diagrams talking about water recycling, PV panels, and things. I'm thinking that's old school sustainability. What's, where's the circular economy thing with that? And I was really. People, when I was writing my book, kept saying, you've got to talk about Venlo City Hall. And then on Twitter, I saw this image, Venlo City Hall, in situ cast concrete deck, in situ cast columns. It's a monolith. It's, it's not going to be a material store for the future. It's going to be recycled at best into aggregates for roads. Why is it clever? So I've managed to get hold of the designers, and I told them that, and they said, yeah, we couldn't afford it. And I said, I thought it was a circular economy, and it made sense. And, they were a bit sheepish. But then I said, well, how did you procure the other materials on the building? And they said they spent four weeks in their offices interviewing three or four or five different uh, companies for every product. And they were try they, what they were trying to do is to get those companies to turn their linear system of raw materials, take, make, and throw away system into a circular one. And they were able to do that on over 30 occasions. So they, what they did do is get their supply chain thinking circular, but I'm not, unfortunately not with the frame. So it was sort of all right, but this is more interesting. This is a year old, and it's interesting yeah. for the people who are the clients, which is the AMB AMRO Bank, a bank that has a property portfolio of 600 billion euros around the world. It's a Dutch state-funded state bank, and it just built this 18 million euro circle pavilion designed for deconstruction and material store for the future, all bolted together, sustainably gleaned timber, insulation made out of denim from employers' old jeans. The, the, the energy is circular, the food is circular, it's all circular. And what was interesting is the banker that presented this to my students and I just said, we're not only a financial bank, we're a materials bank. So using the language of the circular economy, so I thought it was quite interesting. And he said, well, yeah, at the moment, with our 600 billion euro investment, a lot of it is on a 20-year plan. And at the end of that plan, the building is a liability. It's got to be demolished or refurbished, probably demolished. Now, if you design your buildings as a material bank, at the end of their life, they're an asset, not a deficit. So it makes financial sense. This is my last slide. So I think at the moment, we're in this really interesting situation, but this is a colleague of mine from Manhattan, Neil Chambers, and he wrote an all right book with a really good quote in it, and this is a really good quote. <laughs> Don't tell him I said the first bit. If your design team are telling you that their green design would cost more than the norm, ask them to try harder if they can't get a team that can. And it is all about that. It's about the people that know what to do, and a lot of people in this room know what to do. And it's really exciting at the moment because I think some of those people are going to break through. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. That was really good. Um, we have time for some questions, so we're going to pass this mic around, even though you might not need it, but please speak into it because it's being recorded, so we need that for the audio. thinking making its way into the training of architects and the training of builders? Are the people coming out of the colleges equipped to be thinking in this way yet? In places. So they are. I mean, a lot of them get. I would have said the world of architectural training is very aware of uh, the need for low energy buildings. But what they mean by that is energy buildings that don't consume a lot of energy in use. The sort of more lifelong, holistic idea of where do the materials come from, what's the carbon footprint in mining those materials, the whole life of a building, that sort of thing is, is less commonplace, but it is rapidly emerging. So um, a lot of those people I talked about are all teachers as well. So Rotor, for example, Rotor have just, uh, yesterday, they, I couldn't go, but a colleague did, Rotor at the RCA at the moment teaching there. 
so they're all, and they're also teaching in Utrecht. There is a lot happening on in the Netherlands, in, in Northern Europe at the moment. And uh, so that's quite exciting. And I would say is that there's quite a high awareness of these issues with them, uh, designers who are graduating at the moment. Yes. That's very positive. And actually, in addition, I'd say there's a high level of our knowledge with our big contractors, the big builders, the Wilmot Dixons, Robert Mal uh, McAlpine, people like that. They know what to do. They've got very good sustainability people in their, in their businesses. And those people in the past have been charged with avoiding, they, they, with their knowledge, they've sort of been avoiding green issues, as it were. And now they're sort of looking into how they're going to make money out of it. So I, I, it feels like the knowledge is there. Yeah, that's really heartening. How long do you think it'll take to get to the sort of jobbing builder doing extensions and refurbs? Well, they're always, with, with respect to them, they're always the people that are the last to do any of that, health and safety and all that sort of thing. So, but, um, you know, they're not doing... At the moment, because of the way London is, they're not doing the most, most of the work. The bigger contractors are doing most of the work. Um, but we do need governments to change uh, some legislation as well to enable it. Because at the moment, I talk a lot about VAT, actually. If you want to refurbish or extend an existing building, you pay VAT at 20%. If you knock the building down and rebuild a new building, you pay no VAT. So I've actually, the roof of the waste house is made out of timber from a house that I was retrofitting and extending, but it was a big country house. And the VAT was calculated at 360,000 pounds. So the client chose to demolish the building for 7,500 pounds. And then we demolished the building. I salvaged the timber for the waste house roof. But um, the next week, we're building the walls where they were before on the foundations, but everything's zero rated. So he saved money by demolishing. So at the moment, we've got a ridiculous situation where we VAT actively encourages us to demolish because, you know, if, you've only, if you want to do 3,000 pounds worth of work on your house, if you do it legally, you're probably paying VAT on it. So we have clients, I've got my own practice, if a client's coming and say, I've got 100,000 pounds to spend, I say, no, you haven't, you've got 82,500 pounds to spend or whatever, really, because the rest is going to go to the inland revenue. So the government have got to do something to make the situation more equitable there. Um, I had a question about the structural grade of the reused material, because most of your examples were about uh, cladding and other uses of material. But um, in terms of structural grade, that's something you need to have a certain level of certainty. That's why we take comfort in material that come straight from the manufacturers, yeah. where they yeah. can guarantee a certain grade. Um, how, how will we make sure yeah. that? Um, because I was talking about a lot of other things, uh, when I do a lecture just on the waste house, I show the, the structure of the waste house, which was just columns and beams. But they're quite elephantine. <laughs> they're quite big. It looks like a sort of timber stonehenge. And the reason being that um, the structural engineer had to basically assume it was the weakest ply in timber on the market. So then things got big. So it was overstructured. Um, so that we went backwards and forwards with the design quite a lot. So in the case of a timber frame building, normally timber has got a stress grading on it, so you know what, great, what, what you're buying. And that is a problem with second-hand material like timber. You've got that problem. You haven't got such a problem with steel because it has it sort of, it has it on the, st the steel member. You normally do know what you're working with. But with timber, you're right. You're correct. Um, I, think, I think with um, concrete as well, when you mix it, when, when you break down the concrete and mix it because you're not aware of your exact composition of mixed material, that could also be challenging. I mean, in the future, well, where everything has, hopefully, a material have passport, yeah, its own passport, it will be easier. But <coughs> I'm imagining, I can't, I can't understand how we can efficiently use all the materials we have right now in the buildings. I, th I think a lot of them, if you can't understand, yeah, with the, with with concrete, um, if it's an in situ cast homogeneous building yeah. frame. That is only ever you, you got, you've got to try and reuse it without touching it. So you strip everything else back. You've got the frame, and and you know, most frames are on a certain module and a certain size. And what you know, there are tower blocks in Brighton that were due for demolition that are not being demolished now, because the old argument was 
that you needed greater floor to ceiling heights for the plenar, plenum areas to put all the cables and things. Well, now we're getting more and more wireless. wireless. You don't need those voids above the ceiling again. So those frames that were cast in the 1970s are actually valid again. So just leave those alone. But with future frames that you build, and that's why it was so dis disappointing with the Venlo City Hall, you don't do it as a homogenous thing. You use precast concrete elements that can be reused again, lifted out again. So as a, for new buildings, you try not to pour wet, wet materials on site. You try and prefabricate everything and bolt it together so it can be unbolted. there. Um, I work in consumer electronics for the past decade. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm a robot. <laughs> 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 and uh, the point is that sentence to me for a product designer is not true. Uh, it's like your design team might know what to do. Your exec and finance team might be against. Uh, so it's not necessary I don't know what to do. It's just uh, that it's extremely difficult in consumer electronics to do things because I'm here. DFM is probably my real life. My DFM, the design for my factory is probably in California. My assembly line is in uh, Guadalajara in Mexico, and my parts come from China and Korea. So it's like even when you want to take an action. Uh, the implications of the action that you want to take is not only through your personal initiative, but you know, like you have to move quite many resources and people, and it starts to get quite tricky. So here is my question: is like, how much? Like, I believe, like from my experience, that a lot can be accomplished through policies, enforcing policies. Uh, like, are, are you in touch with governments? Like, there, is there like a conversation going on with with institutions to? you know, to enforce certain habits, which are very unlikely to happen without enforcing rules. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think these things are emerging, and really, it's really early days. That comment is by an architect around the construction industry, which is a lot more straightforward, actually, to implement those things rather than a, a sort of high-tech product. So I actually think and the, the reason why I'm quite excited about the idea of a circular economy is I think it's something the, the, the construction industry can embrace and make, make some ground on. I understand with product design it's more difficult. Um, so yeah, that's a quote from an architect to an architect to the construction industry. However, a lot of products are made by about 10 different companies. So uh, you know, those companies have a lot of power. And if they decide, if Apple decides, then it can do it, you know, so it could flip it on its head and maybe a whole, you know, we're all sort of slowing down in our re, the, 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 the rate in which we buy new tech. So, you know, it might be a sort of un, un, unique selling point for Apple. I know there's the, the fair phone that keeps emerging and dying, emerging and dying, but. <laughs> I, I forget comment. Uh, like, yeah, it's like these are the two extremes of the paradox. It's like yeah. Apple can do it because it's usually profitable, yeah. and fair phone can do it because. But when, when you are in the middle of the well, I, th I think with product design, if, with product design, you're going to have to wait for Apple, yeah. or and, and people like that and Google, because uh, but you know they're running out of uh, rare rare mm -hmm. minerals to uh, make their phones work, so they're going to have to do something. But um, I, you know, the construction industry does consume 60% of stuff, so I think if you start there, it's a good start. Cool. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid, but let's thank our speaker again for that. Uh, just a couple of admin things. If you're on the Grantham DTP 